I'm Keith Cambron and this is the course How the Internet Works. This is Hour 1, Section 3, Internet Protocols. Internet protocols um, really have three essential elements. The first part of the uh, protocol is really the message PDU. And in today's discussion, we're going to use an IP datagram as our message PDU. That is uh, equivalent to an API in a programming call, if you think about it. So it's a way of passing a data structure from one system to another uh, to invoke uh, procedures or an expected outcome. The second part of the protocol are the procedures, and those are really uh, procedures that are executed either in the host machine or in uh, routers along the way. They're equivalent to methods in a uh, object-oriented programming model. And then finally we have the state information, the data that must exist in the host machine and the routers in order to be able to execute uh, the procedures and perform the routing. When people think about protocols, I think they normally think about the messages themselves without taking into proper account the procedures and the state information. But we'll start with the um, message PDU because uh, that tells us a lot about the protocol and how it operates. In um, IPv4, and we'll talk about IPv6 later in the course, uh, we have the message format is uh, illustrated here. It's really broken into two large segments, the header and the data or the service data unit that is received from the upper layer. So TCP or UDP would pass a service data unit uh, to the IP protocol, which would then encapsulate it as we've seen here. The uh, IP datagram has been around a long time and um, several decades and uh, has really withstood the test of time. In the uh, datagram itself, there are, I've broken this down into three sections that can be uh, modified by different hosts or routers along the way. The beige section here, or the fields that are marked in beige, are really uh, ones that are provided by the user application, and we'll see in the procedures how that happens. So those are set by the user applications and should not be changed by the host uh, or the router. The fields that are marked with yellow are populated by the originating host. So remember there's two hosts involved in a protocol message, the originating host and the terminating host. So these yellow fields uh, should not be uh, changed by the router. The light blue fields uh, are set by the host originally, but the router may modify them in ways that I'll describe. So let's start at the uh, version and talk about that. The version is a, um, a field, uh, a four bit field, and by the way, these are octets, so uh, the IP PDU is really usually described in sets of four octets. Octet is the same thing as a byte. Communications engineers use the word octet and software engineers uh, use the word byte, but they are the same, one and the same. So this 4-bit field version really refers to which version of the IP protocol we're using and I'm describing IPv4 today so we would expect uh, that bit to be set uh, the, the fourth bit or the third bit from the least significant to be set uh, indicating this is 4. Later on again we'll talk about IP version 6 but not today. The header length is the length of this entire header field it's kept separate and distinct from the length of the entire packet um, because the, the header needs to be processed by each router along the way but certainly the service data unit uh, should not be processed nor does it even need to be examined by the routers along the way. The header length is only four bits 
but it is specified in 32-bit words. So these four octets constitute a 32-bit word. And in this uh, simple example, if the uh, we didn't have any more fields in the header, then we'd see we've got three, four, five, six 32-bit fields or 32-bit or words. Uh, and that would determine the header length. The type of service is really uh, further divided from what I've shown here into multiple fields. Uh, there is a 3-bit field which determines the priority or precedence. So that is where the class of service is stored or embedded uh, in the IP header. Uh, three other bits are devoted to uh, what's called a low delay bit or a delay bit, it can be high or low, a, a throughput bit, and um, a reliability bit. The standard doesn't say how those bits are actually interpreted by routers and how they're used, but they should give the router some uh, idea about the best way to route and process the uh, packet. And then two bits are unused. The total link field uh, specifies just that, the number of bytes in the total packet. So that includes the service data unit as well, and this is the number of octets or bytes uh, that the, the router or host should expect to process in the total length. The next word, or the next 32-bit field, is devoted to the process of um, segmentation because the MTU, the message transport unit, that is the size of the frame of the underlying link layer, uh, may not support the size of the IP packet. IP packets can be as large as uh, 16 bits will allow that are in the total link field or 65,535 octets. And certainly Ethernet has a limit, for example, of 1,500 octets, so you couldn't send a, a full IP packet across an Ethernet frame. The identification is a unique number applied by the host, so the combination of identification, source address, and destination address should be unique over the life of the uh, uh, IP packet. That unique identification number uh, travels with the packet. If a router has an MTU size at its link layer that is less than the size of the IP packet it receives, it must break that packet into multiple packets. Um, and it does that by modifying the flags in the um, fragmentation word, if we want to call this a fragmentation word, and setting the fragmentation offset. So a single packet, if it need to fit into two or more MTUs, uh, because a router didn't have an interface that would support that size of packet, we would see uh, the two packets uh, being uh, segmented, uh, and each would carry some of the service data unit uh, information. Um, there's a lot of details into how that fragmentation offset occurs. Uh, I'm not going to go into it here, but it's important to know that that happens. The identification number doesn't change so that the host on the far end can uh, reconstruct the original packet. The total length does change on the two fragments because it, the total length has to specify the total length of each fragment the total length of the two fragments would equal the total length, well, not exactly. Uh, they would be highly correlated to the total length of the original um, PDU, but of course we're going to have now two headers, one for each of the fragments rather than one, so the total length will be somewhat different. The next fields are the time to live field, the protocol, and the header checksum. The time to live field is uh, populated by the originating host and it specifies how many hops uh, the IP uh, PDU can go through uh, through the various routers 
uh, before it is deemed to uh, expire. And uh, so the application can set the time to live, but typically it would be set by default by the originating host. Every router that processes the IP packet along the way will decrement the time to live when the last router receives uh, an IP packet if the time to live is one or less then that router will discard the packet because uh, it is expired. One of the main benefits is this mechanism prevents uh, packets from being looped in the various networks and running endlessly and consuming bandwidth with no real purpose. The protocol is specifies the upper layer protocol that IP is carrying and uh, there are over 140 protocols that can be carried by the IP layer. Uh, TCP for example is protocol number 6 and UDP is uh, protocol uh, 17 but that is specified in this field it's set by the host and is not modified by the routers along the way. The header checksum is that is a checksum of all the information in the header field and uh, it is set by the host but may be modified by the routers uh, for example if the router has to fragment the IP messages obviously the checksum would change as these fields change. That is the only check performed by the routers for integrity there is no checksum of the service data unit that is processed at the router layer but the idea here is that uh, a malformed IP packet whose checksum fails uh, should be discarded rather than trying to process it. The source IP address can be specified by the application. Uh, many hosts have more than one IPv4 address so it would be up to the application to pick out which one they would use for the source but there's also a default IP address that can be assigned uh, at the IP layer roughly speaking. The destination IPv4 address is always specified by the application and uh, we'll see more about that later on as we examine uh, routing protocols and uh, application layer uh, processing. Options uh, field in the padding are uh, really a broad subject. I won't get into it here except that say that the options are often used by uh, protocols other than a TCP uh, but there are some options that are specified in TCP. In general the options aren't modified by routers but there are some particular cases where they can be so I, I identified it as a, a layer of the or a portion of the protocol that could be modified by routing. The padding fills out the option, fills out the option field so that it uh, will meet the 32-bit um, requirement for an IP word. So let's take a look at some procedures now. We've gone through the packet me message PDU in some detail. Um, these are examples of procedures. The first two examples at the host are the send and receive procedures and this is taken right out of request for comment RFC 791 from the IETF. Uh, the send example as we said the source and destination IP address are specified in the send call. The protocol type uh, is specified here by the application. In this case it might be TCP as an example. The type of service which would determine the priority uh, of the message um, and the time to live. Now time to live isn't normally set by the application but again in RFC 791 goes back about three decades and it shows that one could do that. Then there's a buffer pointer which points to the data, a length indicator saying how long the service data unit is, an identifier, and then a don't fragment bit in this case. Now don't fragment would it be placed into the flags field of the fragmentation word to indicate that uh, the IP package should not be fragmented. And there's some special cases where you'd want to do that, but in general that's not set. Other procedures are fragmentation, which we've already talked about, that can occur in the originating host, and of course there's an assembly 
of fragmented uh, segments at the terminating host if that's necessary. Intervening routers do not invoke fragmentation assembly, but they do fragment IP packets so they can break them apart but not put them back together. And then, of course, there's routing, which is really the procedure that selects an outbound interface, and we're going to get into that in some detail in later sections. The same is true at the router. Of course, they have a routing function to choose an outbound interface. As far as state information, some of the state information is shown here. Uh, destination, which addresses are actually reachable, which is different than a routing function, which is selecting an outgoing interface. Uh, reachability is uh, somewhat of a different function. Layer 2 addresses, we'll talk about that next time. And then um, the, the router has a similar function. In addition, there's some upper layer protocols or different protocols we'll get into that talk about routing and congestion. These are suggested reading. I highly recommend Comer series. It is a classic um, and it's been read by every uh, internet engineer uh, really that's come along. Uh, wonderful book, so I highly suggest you get it.